Welcome to Whiskey and Wonder. All right, all right, all right, everybody. We are back. It's been a few weeks. Hello, everyone. Yes, we're back with a new episode of Whiskey and Wonder. Nice. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's been a little while, but we're back. It has been. That, that's Tyler. I'm Megan. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Tyler. <laughs> Oh God, that was, <laughs> I was 100% trying to do something on the computer Sorry. and, and I heard my name and I'm used to hearing Megan's afterwards. So that was, uh, yeah, that was just 100% a slip, I guess. I don't know. Just, just, <laughs> it was, uh, look, I was in automatic transmission mode, I guess. Okay. Well, uh, I'm Megan. Yep. And I'm Tyler. Yep. And we are whiskey and wonder, uh, podcast where we get together every week and, uh, Review whiskey, teach the other something that has made us wonder. Yes. And so, oh, Lord, how would that lovely start? Um, <laughs> we're going to dive right on in, not keep you guys waiting today. We're going to bust through some announcements, basically the same old stuff. Check out the Patreon, vote for the Infinity Bottles, which if you don't know, it's our own personal blends. Um, and we're gonna, we're letting you guys decide what goes in there. Uh, so just go uh, vote on it over on our Patreon. I think it's two dollars a month to vote on those. So, uh, and we do those for bourbon dries and scotches. You can see them if you're on YouTube. They are behind Megan's head. Uh, nope, way over there. Yep. And we only have two bottles at the moment because, frankly, I just haven't emptied another bottle. Uh, so as soon as I get another one emptied, I'll wash it out and we'll start putting. We'll put all the scotches I have in the cabinet in there uh, just to get a base going, and then. You guys can vote as we do scotches from there on out. Um, I did you hear that? The beep 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 yeah. beep beep. Yep, sure did. I have no idea what that was. Um, okay. Hopefully it's nothing. Hopefully it's nothing related to our setup. Anyway, yep. um, check us out on uh, whiskeywonder dot com. We've got merch there, t shirts, stickers. Um, Whiskey, tumblers with our logo, all that kind of cool stuff. So you can see our uh, partnerships and uh, whiskeys we've tried, things we want to try. Yes, biographies about who we are, what we did before we were whiskey and wonder, or what we do other than whiskey and wonder. Um, we are. So this is something that I need more details on, but I'm gonna at least float the idea out there. I know we have some people that. Check us out on YouTube. If if not, please do. You can get the video. You can see my ugly mug, and you can see Megan. Um, you can see some of our cool whiskeys behind Megan. If you're if you're um, keen a keen observer, you might notice some changes week to week. I can see one specific one that I doubt Megan's even noticed. Mm. Um, but anyway, as she's looking for that, if you. I'm not sure how it works, so I need to do some research in there, but I know we can sell. Uh, I've seen channels that have like t-shirts and stuff on YouTube as well. So that might be a little bit of an easier link to help you guys uh, if you want to get a t-shirt or anything. So definitely I'm going to look into doing that and check us out on YouTube. Subscribe, like us. That helps us go up. We want to get a nice, neat YouTube link that's, uh, you know, like whiskey, uh, youtube.com slash whiskey and wonder, but we need subscriptions for that. So it would do us. A huge favor if you if you guys would do that. That would be awesome. Thank um, you. You can check us out online. You can find us, like I said earlier, whiskeyandwonder.com. Search us on YouTube, Whiskey and Wonder. Uh, anywhere you get your podcasts, you can probably find us. Patreon.com slash Whiskey and Wonder if you want to donate. Help us. You get some rewards over there. Get some early access. Some mm -hmm. Percentages off of your uh, whatever kind of merch purchase you want to make. So, uh, And all that's explained over on Patreon. And contact at whiskey and wonder.com um so yeah those are the main places i'm not even gonna put instagram up there because we don't really do that anymore <laughs> we so, suck yep um other than that i guess just thank you to everybody that makes this possible i know it's been a couple weeks since we've been on here we'll talk a little bit about that in the open segment here in a little bit but to everybody that has supported us and that does support us, we apologize for not, not being a little more consistent. Life's been crazy, but, you know, thank you for supporting us and thank you for helping us keep Whiskey and Wonder going. Definitely. We couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you guys so much. So, 
Um, did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, I'm good. All right. My mouthful is done. The open segment. So a little behind the scenes here. Uh, I think the last episode we did, Megan ran the controls. Mm -hmm. Did you turn my volume up? No, but my volume is also incredibly loud. Okay. Good to know. Maybe it's... I don't know I, why. I think I turned it up on the system then. So, okay. I, I might have been listening to some music or watching a video in here. I try not to do that and mess with it, but... All right. So. Life. Yeah. What's been going on? I think I've seen you... God, it's been... <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen you in weeks. It's been so yeah, long. <laughs> it's, I, don't, I don't even know exactly how long it's been. It's been 84 years. Yeah, so... Um, I think I... Just to summarize for anybody... I don't know... So you couldn't record. I don't know if you want me to say why. Sure. Okay, so... I can't remember why. <laughs> so the last episode I think we were together, I did... It was episode 90... Two, it was like a month ago. I did the Boston Massacre one. Uh-huh. And then I think you got COVID. Yep. So Megan had COVID. Yep. And life just kind of got in the way on my end. And I wasn't able to even honestly do a from the vault. Um, I think that was the... No. Nope, last, that... last week you didn't even do a from, from the vault. Yes. So three weeks ago you had COVID. Two weeks ago, I was on vacation, and you and Jamie did an episode. Yes. Last week, I was at the race. Yes. And so, and your dad was in town at the race with me, and then with you, and just with all that jumbled confusion. Yes, it, there was a lot going yeah. on. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's been it's been a hectic couple of weeks. October, I've been working double extra shifts at the brewery, and. It's event time of the year, so. All but anyway, right. what's been going on with you? All right. Um, well, yes, I had COVID. Um, that sucked. Do not recommend. Uh, don't want to get that shit again. Um, I still have a little bit of a cough. Like, I just have accepted that that's part of my life now. Um, it goes away. I hope so. It's been awful. Um I believe anyone who listened to the episode I recorded with Jamie learned that my eyes are currently fighting for custody of my brain. Um, I didn't listen, so <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, the reason why I'm still having issues with a concussion and everything all these weeks later um, is because something that can happen during concussions that is apparently fairly common uh, is your eyes like fight for dominance? Like your eye that's normally dominant anymore loses it, and so both eyes are trying to be the dominant eye. So they're both fighting for custody of my brain. So I'm in physical therapy to try to teach them to be friends again. Um, and they're letting you drive. They're letting me drive. Yep. As long as I don't close one eye, like um, I'm okay. But my vision goes like shifts. If I close an eye, but, mm. but yeah, it's strange. But yeah, I can drive, um, have to work shorter shifts, um, do like exercises and stuff, um, and just kind of like boring, lame concussion things. Um, let's see, interesting stuff. Uh, for those of you on YouTube, you probably noticed something a little bit different than uh, you normally see with me. I'm not going to lie. I don't think they would. You don't think so? No, nobody can see your face. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just got to well. give you a little bit of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Jerk. Yep. Um, those of you guys not on YouTube or who can't see my face, I don't have glasses on. For the first time <gasps> in years, I stopped wearing contacts when I was 18 um, and switched solely to glasses. And I'm one of the people who literally can't see without assisted vision. So I can't just take my glasses off. Like they have to be either on or I have to be asleep. Um, do you know what a sonic cleaner is? 
No, but that sounds like uh, like the Sonicare toothbrushes. So same concept. So it's what um, it's what you have at the eye doctor when they clean your glasses really nice, um, and it's what jeweler jewelry stores have to clean rings and stuff. It's basically this machine that you put a special solution in, and it vibrates so fast it like knocks all the dirt and everything and particles off. Okay. Whatever you're cleaning in there. And there's a very big warning that says if you wash your glasses in this or anything, but if you put something in this that has a scratch or any type of um, defect, abrasion or defect, yeah. this will make it worse and it will ruin it. And I was like, I cleaned my ring and my ring looked so good, brand new. And I was like, I can put my glasses in here. I can put my here. glasses in here. And I saw the warning and I looked at my glasses and I was like, there's a little bit of a scratch, but it's not, it's not that bad. It's going to be fine. And I put my glasses in this silent cleaner and it vibrated for 600 seconds. Um, and I got them out. That's and, 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Okay, that's a long vibration. I got them out, <laughs> and the lenses are destroyed. It looks like I took gravel and just went... <laughs> Smart. It. Did you know you had a crack in them? Yes. I didn't think it was that bad. I, <laughs> I have learned... <laughs> to adhere to the warning label. Um, so I was like, oh my God, there has to be a way I can fix this. Uh, spoiler alert, there's not. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, I know a way you can fix it. Get new glasses. Uh, so luckily my eye doctor was able to get me in like the very next day for an appointment. Um, <laughs> I had to wear my glasses there and luckily Houston was off so he could drive me because like, it it was like looking through, uh, like, I can see through this this QT cup better than I could see through my glasses. It was. She said, "I, I don't know horrific. if that came through on oh, the mic well. because she she put the cup in front." But just in case, that was she could see better through the cup. Yes, I could see better through a, a semi transparent cup than I could see through my glasses. Um, but my doctor got me in and it turns out those have been my same glasses since 2017. So they really needed to be updated anyway. Um, my right eye, it's prescription changed so drastically that the doctor was kind of shocked how bad my right eye had gotten. Um, and I've always had really, really poor vision and it just gets worse and worse every year. Um, I can relate. Yeah. Uh, so I... Went to the doctor, got a new prescription, um, and ordered a new pair of glasses, but the glasses will take two to three weeks to get made. Um, that seems excessively long. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't gotten glasses in a while, um, so I don't remember. I remember I ordered them online. I didn't go through my pharmacy. Mm. Um Maybe that would be yeah, faster. I don't know. I, I don't remember where I got them from, but it was one of those like websites. I don't. I don't know. I ordered them through the the eye doctor. Um, and they, it's going to take two to three weeks. Mm. So until then, I had to get contacts for the first time in twelve years. Nearly twelve years. Yikes! Wow. I'm old. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, me too. So I have um, daily contacts now that I'm wearing. Until I get glasses. Nice. So that is my very long story of how I'm an idiot. Well, I don't have any fun, super fun stories. Um, I'm trying to think what all's happened because everything's been such a blur. Uh, mainly it's just work. I went to the race and it was like, it was a cool atmosphere. It was fun to go, but it was a boring race. It was a very boring race. Um, and, you know, I guess that's just... I don't want to say that's the chance you take, 
but I don't want to get into a NASCAR soapbox here, but let's, let's, long story short, they redesigned the car in the off season and it's kind of made some of the races that used to be boring, exciting, but it's made all of the races that used to be exciting, boring. And so they've kind of flip flopped and it just, it sucks because this is one of those races that used to be exciting. And so when you go there, you're expecting a good race. It, you know, it's not a track that you're like, well, I'm going to this race just to go. It's going to be a boring race, but I'm going for the experience. And that's what ended up happening. I so. cannot relate at all. Like every race in my opinion is boring. So I cannot relate, but I'm glad you went and enjoyed the atmosphere and you got to hang out with my dad, which yep. is pretty neat. Yeah. We got to, we got to shoot shit for a little while and, and I drove them literally. I handed them off to Megan. Like I didn't even see Megan. No. Yeah. She was in the house and we were, we had to rush to get back here to try and get some stuff done. So yeah, it was like, drop. It was, honestly, it was kind of like dropping kids off. <laughs> you know how like the divorced parents <laughs> drop kids off? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so Paula and Papa Bill, if you hear that. <laughs> <laughs> You're our kids that we're yep. sharing custody of in the divorce. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, in other news, I think uh, the most current thing is the biggest news I can't really talk about on here. So, yeah, sorry. TBD. Nah. Never, okay. Yeah, it's one of those. TBD to me. Yeah. None of y'all. Yeah, TBD to Megan. And (laughs) and sorry. Just don't feel comfortable putting all that out there. Fair, fair. Yesterday I worked an event for the brewery. It was the hot air balloon thing. Like actual hot air balloons? Yeah, there's a big... Celebration or festival or something up near Statesville every year. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, it is. Um, And we poured, we had a line for like eight straight hours, which is awesome. It is, that is making a ton of money for the brewery, but being bent at like a 45 degree angle because the kegs Mm -hmm. are in front of you and you've got to bend Bend over over to get it. To bend over to reach the customers to get their money and to, uh, you know, hand in the beers and whatnot is just killer on your back and standing just on the ground. It can be killer. So my back and ankles specifically today. Just killing, are, killing yeah, you. It's been a day of nothingness. Fair. Yeah. Fair. So, um, that, that's basically been it. Just a bunch of work. And like I said earlier, and life's been heck. Oh, I... <laughs> I don't know if he'll want me to mention this on here or not, but uh, I was at the race uh, with Megan's dad. I got a call from my cousin, my older cousin, um, and we we like to see each other at family events. Love the love the dude to death, but we're just not those people that we don't talk much, you know. Yeah. And I get a call from him, and I'm at the race. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to hear the guy, so I shut it down, and I'm in the middle of texting him. Hey, I'm at the race. I'll call you back later. When I get another call from him, Uh oh! I was like, that always freaks me out. Yeah. I was like, oh shit, this is bad. So I answer it and all I hear is, hey, I fucked up. I shot, no, 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 no. All the cars go by and I was like, you did what? And you're calling me? Who the <laughs> fuck did you shoot? Like what? So it turns out my cousin had, he was... As as he he shot himself in the foot with a shotgun. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, point blank range. Oh my god! Um, Does he have a foot? Yeah, surprisingly, I've got pictures if you want to see. If you like gory shit, I actually kind of want to yeah, see. I got them. I want to see it. You can see it. Ugh, um, I want to see it. It's disgusting. I I don't want to see it. But so he <laughs> basically was taking the, I yeah he was taking the gun to clean it. As far as he knew, he said he always leaves it empty. Mm. And as far as he knew, it was empty. He had it by the buttstock. Um, and he thinks, he's like, my hand was nowhere near the trigger. I have no idea how it went off. And so he's like, I think I had a strap on there that had a, uh, you put shotgun shells in the strap. He's like, I think one of those shotgun shells flung, flung around and 
hit the trigger and, and it just happened to be pointing at my foot. Um, so they did take one of his toe, his middle toe, so he can't give you the toe anymore. He can't give you the toe. Um, I told him if they took his foot, I was calling him Stumpy, and he was laughing his <laughs> ass off. Um, so he's in good spirits. Oh, that's but, good. But yeah, that's the that's the long and short of it. Um, he's home now. Wow. Last I heard, he still has a foot. So wow. They were thinking about taking some more more toe, but he's got he's got shit all in his foot. He'll probably never. Never completely heal walk and right walk right. And, yeah. Oh. So. And that is why you always practice gun safety, yep. kids. Keep the safety on. Yep. Safety even, always even on. Even if you think it's unloaded, yep. treat every gun like it's loaded. Every gun is loaded. Yep. Period. So um, with Oof, that, I think Jesus. I think this will be funny. So get, forgive me for being on my phone here. Oh, you're going to show me it on, I'm on gonna air? I'm going to let Megan, yeah, I think her reaction is going to be worth it. Okay. Well, as you pull that up, um, obviously, uh, I was super... You can, uh, if you scroll to the, scroll, swipe, so that the pictures come from the right. Swipe so the pictures come from the right. Yeah. Swipe okay. left. Okay. Oh, my God, Jesus. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. It's it's Who gory. It? It's gory. <laughs> Come oh. on, swipe it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. I don't know how. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Oh, fuck. That just, ooh. he is. <laughs> so I'll, I'll describe it for you guys, what the first one she saw was. It's by far the, the gruesomest. Uh, it's basically just a crater. <laughs> of blood in his Cr foot. Crater is a good word for that. It is a crater left by a shotgun blast yeah. in a foot. Dead. I mean, dead center mass on his foot. It was a good shot if he was aiming for it. <laughs> but <Jesus. laughs> anyway, so uh oh that that has my hair hair standing on end and like goosebumps and ooh, 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 ooh. Ugh, no thank you. Um, I just gave myself massive, massive vertigo. Uh, the room oh, is spinning. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't pass out on me. If you do, at least just lean back in the chair. It'll go, catch you. Go backwards. Um, that'll be a fun episode of Whiskey and Wonder. <laughs> uh, one more thing for the open segment. Sure. Um, just thank you, uh, Dad, Papa Bill, for coming uh, to North Carolina. Um we definitely did not have enough time together, and I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. So, I love and miss you, Dad. Absolutely, and I want to piggyback on that and say thank you to Papa Bill and Paula for uh, buying my and Shelby's ticket to the race. Thank you all so much. I hate that it was a boring race, um, but you know what? It was fun. So, nice. And I promise I did not mean to almost kill you walking back to my car. <laughs> <laughs> I would have came and picked you up. <laughs> um, all right. On that note, guys, let's move it on. Let's get to what we're drinking today. Opening the bottle. All right. Well, today we are drinking a uh, rye whiskey that Tyler has most definitely had before. Yes. Um, before Megan dives in, I want to just say one thing real quick just to set it up. Um, so I did not obviously drink what they had two weeks ago. I am going to drink that and give my rating on it at the end of the show. Cool. So now back to what the main feature yes. is. Well, today we are drinking Sazerac Rye. And as you can see, half it's the half the bottle empty. is gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so you can probably guess. Tyler I, probably likes this. I've shared it. I've had it before this bottle, so I knew what I was getting into. All right. Well, Sazerac Rye is produced by Sazerac Company, Inc. at Buffalo Trace Distillery. Sazerac is headquartered in New Orleans and was founded in the 1800s. According to the company, it started with the cocktail, then the bar, then the company. Antony, I'm assuming is how he wants to have his name pronounced. Antony Pachad, a Creole immigrant, would mix brandy, absinthe, and bitters. He created at his pharmacy located in the French Quarter. The cocktail became popular at the city's coffee houses, which was the term used for drinking establishments at the time. 
Pechard's concoction became most strongly associated with one coffee house in particular, the Sazerac Coffee House, located on Exchange Alley. The coffee house's owner, Sewell Taylor, institutionalized the drink by using only Sazerac de Forge a filet brandy, which he imported to the U.S. and sold exclusively. This cocktail earned its name as a result. Thomas H. Handy acquired the Sazerac Coffee House in 1869 and then Pichaud's Bitters in 1873. Thereafter, in the 1890s, his company bottled and marketed the Sazerac Cocktail, which is now made with rye whiskey as opposed to brandy. C.J. O'Reilly, Handy's secretary, chartered the Sazerac Company. <laughs> so... I'm going to. I, I'll, I'm. I'm going to be honest with everybody. Oh shit! I almost knocked it over. Um, Shelby and I went to visit her brother. I've I've heard of Sazerac. It is something that people ooh and ah over, and you know, like most things, they ooh and ah over. It's just like a. Uh, Oh, that came through really clear. Oh, did it? <laughs> yeah, Shit, did. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was funny. Um, so, like most things that people, um, you know, ooh and all over it, it there's a fifty fifty chance of whether it's going to be good or not. So, I happened to get a sample of this when Shelby and I went to visit her brother. He had a bottle of it, and I knew what I was getting when I bought this bottle. Um. So I'm not going to say anything other than that when un, until we get further into it. But I did know what I was getting. Whether or not it's worth being oohed and awed over remains to be seen. Do you remember Altoid? Do you remember? <laughs> Sorry. Do you remember Altoid Sours? Nope. F- from when we were children? Nope. Mm-mm. Okay. Altoids, the mint company, made these sour candies that were the best thing on the entire fucking planet, and then they stopped making them, and they don't make them anymore. Um, But they had three flavors, and the best flavor was tangerine. Sour tangerine Altoid candy. Eww. You say, eww. But this whiskey that I breathed into the mic because I was so like hit by nostalgia. Well, all right. So here's the thing. I don't know if it came through the mic. I heard it. I heard okay. it a second time when you did it. So I don't know when you did it away. It from might the mic. just, so it might've okay. just been my Vulcan hearing <laughs> or the fact that I was so hit by nostalgia. I was just like, <gasps> <gasps> oh. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, so anyone, any millennial or, older generation who remembers Altoids Sours Tangerine. This is what this smells like. The sour citrus, you know, deep inside, it's like sweet. And I, I just, that it is Altoids Sour Tangerine. So is to, the aroma. To me, it is uh, definitely there's, there's, there's a fruity aroma there. I don't know so much. I can't compare it to the Sour Altoids, because I never even knew Altoids did a sour thing. That sounds really good, though. Um, I definitely get some fruit in there, and I get some vanilla. And just the subtle, subtlest rye spice. Very subtle rye. I forgot this was a rye. Yes, it's a rye. Well, we are supposed to be smelling aromas of orange zest, clove, and raisin. Hints of rye spice and... Ooh, I always fuck up this word. Anise? Anise? Anise. Anise. Ha ha, I was right the first time. Um, so pretty simple-ish palette according to that. Um, I still am sticking with Altoid Sours. All right. Well, I tasted it. And it tastes like Sazerac rye. Um, I feel like I'm almost an expert on it at this point. Megan, sorry, I took a sip while Megan's thinking. She's over there. So I get a very smooth, smooth whiskey. Um, There's a little bit of a uh, oaky, kind of woody finish on the end. Um, 
definitely a creamy, creamy mouthfeel, creamy flavor towards the beginning. Um, not so much, not a ton of rye spice, not a ton of pepper. I don't know if it is my brain playing tricks on me, but I taste <laughs> Altoid Sour Tangerine as one of the flavors. Like it's, I taste the, like maybe you dropped one of the candies in there and let it dissolve. Um, but it is a, it is a very creamy mouthfeel. Um, it's a like peppery sensation, but not overly burny. Very, um, very mild pepper. Yes, yeah, very, more kind of like um, pop rocky. Like it, I feel the spice in but my mouth, but it's not. Oh, to me, it's like, I would put it on par with like a peppermint. Yeah. Like, but like it, it's it's a different style, but the heat level. The heat level is, is peppermint. Like peppermint. But peppermint. the style to me is like. Yeah. Like I, pop rocks. Yeah, yeah, okay. It kind of like pops on different parts of my okay, mouth. I can I see what you're saying there. Um. Creamy mouthfeel, Altoids, sour, tangerine, um, poppy, I, peppermint. I just definitely had a um, had another sip, and I get a like that cream, vanilla cream flavor, uh, especially swishing it around my mouth. So, a little bit of rye. I can kind of tell it's a rye on the yeah. back end. Yeah, um, it just kind of lingers. That flavor, yeah, lingers like it, it just in your mouth, in, yeah, in the back of your throat. Kind exactly, of, so. exactly. Um. All right. Anything else you want to mention about tasting it? Uh, no, it's... not about tasting it. I will just say. Um. I, I'll, I well, I was going to give the cost and the proof, but I'll do that once you've wrapped all that up. Okay. Well, we are supposed to be tasting fruit flavors, comprised of sweet apricots, orange peel, and plums. Uh, caramel notes of caramel and vanilla, light barrel char. Um. Anise and raisin underneath. Um, the finish is supposed to be rye spice um, and a light black licorice, which, thank God, I do not taste black licorice. Yeah, I don't either. Because black licorice was is made by the devil. What hell tastes like? I think I'd rather put anything in my mouth other than black licorice. All right. Well, um, I will. Tell a little story about this bottle. Um, I stopped in at one of my usual ABC stores that I hit up in the middle of nowhere. Because in my mind, that's where nobody's going to be buying this sort of stuff. And I had another bottle in my hand that I was walking to the front. And lo and behold, there it was. You behind the counter. It. A bottle. One Bottle One bottle of Sazerac rye. And I said to the lady, is that a bottle of Sazerac? And she goes, yeah, it's the last one. I want that. I walked right back to where I had grabbed the other whiskey, which was the Uncle Nearest 1884, which we did on here. It was very good. I wanted another bottle because I'm almost out. And we did that in episode, oh, it's a Tennessee whiskey. So that would be episode 31, where Megan and I both gave it a seven. All right. So I had that in my hand, and then I went, I saw the size rack and said, I will have one of those, please. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, nice. I think I paid $32 for it, and it usually is 28 to 35 okay. is, is a fair price for it. So it is 93 proof, I think. 90 proof, sorry. 90 proof. So it's only 45% alcohol. Um. So yeah. All right. Like I said earlier, it is one of those that people oo and awe over. So we'll see if Megan oohs or ahs. Hmm. I'll be thinking about it. Okay. Well, on that note, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of our folks that support us, or do you want me to tell us? I will <laughs> I'll tell start. us. I'll start. Because Megan's got to pull up her little spiel. So we want uh, this episode of Whiskey and Wonder, and we want to thank um, Flaviar for being a partner with us. Uh, and this episode's brought to you by Flaviar. If you go to whiskeyandwonder.com slash sponsors, there's a link there that can uh, link you over to Flaviar. You get a free, 
what is it, a free month mm -hmm. of Flaviar? Free extra month of Flaviar if you go and sign up over there. Flaviar is basically, uh, if you're a long-time listener, we've had it on here before where it's a quarterly subscription. You can do uh, three vials, three like taster vials. It's basically enough for me and Megan to get, uh, you know, enough to do an episode of Whiskey and Wonder each. Uh, so you get three different whiskeys and then you get a, you can add on a entire fifth mm -hmm. to it for, for an increase. Um, and you get that every couple of months and they will ship it directly to your door and they ship it very, very carefully. It's very well packaged. Um, we love Flaviar. Unfortunately, North Carolina stopped them from shipping here. So we're due to laws. We can't get them here, but I wish to God we could. Yes. I'm, um, I'm awaiting the moment we can get them again. I'm so. writing my congressman. Yeah. Um, Call your congressman, write them, yeah. tell them we want Flaviar back. Yes. So, uh, but it's a great gift for, for the, you know, we're coming up on the holiday season. It is wonderful yeah. for the whiskey drinker in your life. Yep. So get them, check out Flaviar.com. Check it out. Go to whiskeywonder.com slash sponsors. Click on the Flaviar link there. That'll send you over. Like I said, you can, it's a monthly, or I'm sorry, quarterly subscription. And so you get an extra month or shipment with that. I guess it would be an extra shipment since it's quarterly. Um, so yeah, thanks Flaviar. Yes, thank you Flaviar. And we do actually have a wonder, uh, wonder code. <laughs> Spoiler alert. We do have a promo code with Flaviar at checkout. If you type in wonder, that will get you your deal with us. And that is W-O-N-D-E-R, Wonder, at checkout. Your privacy matters, which is why we've partnered with NordVPN to keep our podcast friends safer on the internet. Using NordVPN keeps your browsing and information private while giving you access to an encrypted cloud to store your files and generating special passwords to make getting hacked nigh impossible. We love NordVPN because of how much their service helps us during our Wonder we research. Using NordVPN allows us to access streaming services across the globe, letting us watch documentaries that aren't currently available to American servers. With a click of a button, NordVPN can make it appear as if I'm in the UK, allowing me access to the European library on Netflix. Tune into episode 45 of Whiskey and Wonder to learn about the importance of cybersecurity and get a whopping 68% off a two-year subscription of NordVPN when you go to whiskeyandwonder.com, head over to our sponsors, and click on that NordVPN link. Yes, and thank you to both Flaviar and NordVPN. We also have other partners uh, that you can check out again. That's whiskeyandwonder.com slash sponsors. These guys help keep us going, help us produce this for you. So now that that's over and we've done our mandatory, uh, you know, keep this, keep the lights on stuff, um, <clears throat> we'll dive into the wonder segment. But first, I posed the challenge to Megan earlier about looking at what's behind her to see if she could figure out what's different. I'm curious. It will be a spoiler for something in a future episode, so I'm curious as to what, if she noticed it or not. I did not. All right. Well, then I will tell her later. It's time for the Wonder Segment. It's time for the Wonder Segment, Asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so you're going to go into detail about this. All right. Yep, because um, this is not up to my normal quality. And um, I was under the impression that this was not my week to do a Wonder segment up until about two hours ago. And then I was like, someone mentioned to me like... Uh, that it's it was my week this week, um, and they were talking about the topic I was going to do, and I was like, "No, it's Tyler's week," and they were like, "No, it's not," and I was like, "Yes, it is," and so I texted Tyler, and I was like, "This is your week," and he was like, "No, it's not." No, nope, I did the Boston <laughs> Massacre. Like I've been, I was, I almost sent you a text early in the week. I was like, "Hey, just want to make sure you know it's your week," and I was like, "Nah, she knows. She's on." Uh, I don't want to say she's on the ball because you are on the ball, but... Me! 
<laughs> like you know, I fell off the ball. Well, <laughs> it got out right. of my control, it's and I right. hit the back of my head, and I have a concussion. Um, so this wonder segment, um, is not going to be like anything else we've uh, done because this uh, was two hours of preparing to be. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna. I, I disagree with that. <clears throat> I think we have. Done something similar. You got to go. You got to get in the you way, go way, way, way back, back. Far, far away. Uh, before the YouTubes. If I can find. Before. Yeah. Uh, a lot of I, things. I want this over here. So, yeah. Way back. Uh, to episode six, I believe. Hey, wait. That means we've passed two years. Um, yeah. Episode six. It was a Halloween special we did where Megan and I took turns telling each other ghost stories. Yes. Spoiler alert for what we're doing today. Yes. Well, kind of. Sort of. Um, I will be telling Tyler stories. Yeah, Megan's going to try to... Well, it is spooky season, so Megan's going to try to scare me with some ghost stories. Yes. And I'm going to set the mood by turning some of the lights down in here. Ooh, spooky. Which, you know, see see what I can do here. So bear with me for a minute, Megan. You're going to have to fill some air, so Oh, don't worry. I have... I. All right. You go ahead and get the mood set. Uh, so in a panic... I was like, okay, I have two hours to figure out what to do. And I was like, all right, Tyler, I can get uh, friend Jamie on here and we can just bullshit about something. Um, and I'm not going to say the thing we were going to bullshit about because it will be a wonder segment at some point. Um, it's something we both know quite a bit about and are very interested in-ish. Um or uh, I could try to, like, I I kind of was just throwing random ideas at him. Like, I don't know what happened. What, I don't. I, I failed. I dropped the ball big time. So one of my suggestions was I can read scary stories on the internet because it's spooky season. And Tyler was like, yeah, do that. Yeah, it's, it seems like a cool <laughs> thing to try and scare me. I don't scare very easily. So, um, yeah, I'm... I'm I'm game for this, so I'm gonna turn my lights down. I've turned Megan's. I've left Megan's arm up because, unfortunately, the way things are right now, we have a light here, but I can't make it shine on both of us. And I think I found a solution to that. So I'm gonna do some reorganizing. But I left her lights on a little brighter. I'm gonna actually turn one of them up just a smidge to see All her right. better. Okay. But well, we've made it semi dark in here. Yes. Ooh. Spooky season for a totally planned ghost story episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, again, I didn't have any uh, plans doing this. Uh, these are not stories that I have written. They are um, stories that have been found on the interwebs. So I will give credit where credit is due. I have several of them lined up. Um and I'm going to basically read until Tyler says, we have a long enough episode and we need to stop. <laughs> so, Jesus. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> I have like 10 I found, which I think would take probably until midnight. So I don't think you want to do like a four hour episode. No, I was thinking maybe maybe three or four max. All right. So I'd... pick your pick your best four and then we'll judge time. Okay. We're already at uh, 43 minutes. Just a heads up. Okay. All right, your is your ambiance what you want it to be? Uh, yeah. If not, I'll play with it. Okay. I can I can pretend to multitask. <laughs> there we go. I'll turn that. There we go. All right. So this is why my childhood was spent suffering from chronic audio hallucinations by Jasprit Gruwal. What a name! Firstly. I experienced chronic audio hallucinations as a child, and this is why. My parents were both uneducated, working-class folk themselves, and were conditioning me to become an overachiever to break the cycle. They always made sure I was busy during the day, whether I was at school, the library, basketball, karate, Boy Scouts, or piano practice. My life was completely routinized. No questions asked. My mom was my chauffeur all day. I'd wake up at 8 a.m., be home by 8, and into bed by 9, exhausted after a typical day in my innocent six-year-old life. I'd fall asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow, 
but not before the hallucinations began. How can I begin to describe the sensation of hearing things that don't exist? I'd hear blood-curdling moans and screams full of pain and anguish. I can't remember exactly when they started, but I could only hear them when I was alone. They would pierce through the silence of my pitch-black room, resonating through my bones and into the floorboards. They'd stop and start randomly. Sometimes it was a woman, sometimes a man, sometimes it was children. Sometimes they were quiet, sometimes they roared. For hours they haunted me, inconsistently and relentlessly. I felt psychotic. How does a child being to handle insanity? As for all humans alike, getting into bed and falling asleep is when the hectic world finally slows down, a break from reality. But for me, it became the most dreaded part of my day. It got to the point where I was afraid to go to sleep, or even go into my room for that matter. I'd call out for my mom when I couldn't take the torment anymore. I was particularly close with my mom my whole life. I became an extreme mama's boy from spending so much time with her. She just knew exactly how to ease the storm in my mind. It's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. It's all just a dream. She'd reassure me and sleep in my bed for the rest of the night. I knew it wasn't a dream, but still her gentle words always brought this inexplicable peace to my soul. I would tell her about the hallucinations loud and often, but she was just a simple homemaker from a small town with a huge heart. She didn't know how to handle mental illness, but sure tried her best to. Here, drink up. She'd pass me a cup of warm tea and stroked my head. If it wasn't her soft voice, tea always helped me relax. Everything's been great since. I stayed an overachiever, got a job at a great investment firm after finishing my MBA. I moved from the States to the UK, married a hot dancer I met in Benihana, and had two bouncing baby boys. Life's virtually perfect. My parents got their wish. I've grown into everything they wanted me to be. But I very rarely get to see them anymore. Every now and then, I wonder what they're up to. I sit at the kitchen table with my morning jalapeno cream cheese bagel. The smell of sausage fills the air as my wife works away flipping pancakes on the stove. I take a quick glance at the pink and indigo sky and pull up the daily newspaper on my tablet. The top headline, The Tea Party Killer, Incarnate of Evil. Below was a photo of the convicted, a graying, middle-aged man with thin lips curled into a tired smile. My dad. Quote, After 15 years of tireless investigation and thousands of tips, Marcus Gables was finally arrested in his Albuquerque home following a joint effort by local authorities and the FBI. Inside, authorities also found over 200 mason jars full of blood that they believe was extracted from his estimated 150-plus victims. Gables managed to stay under the radar for 40 years. The reason it is believed that he was able to evade detection for so long is because of the random selection of his victims, varying in race, age, and gender. He's called the Tea Party Killer because he would sip on the blood from ceramic ceramic cups like tea as it drained from his still-living victims. His last victim was his wife, who went willingly after he confessed to officers after they knew authorities were on to him. They're going to execute him. My mom was his last victim because that's how she wanted to go. They were both in on it. That's why they tried their hardest to keep me busy and out of that house, basically, until I moved out. That's what the moaning noises were. The hallucinations I thought I was having. Everything. What did they think I was? A little potato who had no idea about what happened inside his own house? I figured it out not too long after my 12th birthday, on one of the rare days I was completely home alone. Usually mom was always home, but my aunt happened to have a baby that day, so she left the house for several hours to go visit her, and I was sick in bed with a bad cold. To be fair, it happened completely innocently. I didn't mean to find them. I'd been watching cartoons all day, and my mind was naturally wandering in a thousand directions as I laid lazily on the living room sofa. 
I had the sudden realization that I'd never been to my basement before. I'd been told growing up that there was just a storage room there for my dad's car stuff, so I never really bothered to go down. My life was on the surface anyway. But that day, I went, young and curious. I lived in a bungalow, and the entrance to the basement was detached. I went outside my house, around the side, and down a grimy flight of stairs. I opened the door only to enter an empty room. In the corner, I noticed a smaller door that you had to crouch to get through. The lock on it was already unlocked, so I swung open the door. The putrid odor of rotting flesh and urine sunk into my lungs and made me puke instantly. Inside, I saw a circular table with two chairs around it and a stack of dirty cups to the side of it. Three naked bodies hung from the ceiling on metal hooks like pigs for slaughter. One was a child, no other older than five. Thick ropes suspended them from their ankles, their lanky arms dangling below them, ropes around their necks to keep them from moving around, and clear plastic tubes forced into their wrists. Blood was only being drawn from two people of the three, the ones that were still alive. One was a child sobbing quietly, and the other an elderly gentleman, who looked like he was just hanging on to his final moments of consciousness. The third body was a middle-aged woman hanging idly, her skin turned ice blue and eyes bloodshot red swelled, swelling out of the sockets from the pressure of the blood settling in her head. I couldn't push the memory of them out of my system, no matter how hard I tried. But the police estimated 150 victims? Try 1,500. But that's just a rough guess. Something inside me broke that day. I know I should have said something. I should have told someone. But I loved my parents too much, and they loved me. I needed them, and I couldn't risk having them taken away from me, so I kept their twisted secret locked inside my mind. I put down my tablet after reading the article, still trying to reel myself back from the shock that he finally got caught, and also that he killed my mom. My lovely, darling mom. I sit back in my chair, forlorn, and trying to deal with the flurry of thoughts racing through my head. I take another bite of my jalapeno bagel as my three-year-old hugs onto my leg, asking for a bite of my food. I give him a tiny bite and then some of my tea to wash it down with. He loves tea just as much as I do. I take a big gulp of the tea to calm my nerves. The bitter tinge of copper mingles with my taste buds. Despite everything... The taste of it has never grown old on me. Read that last sentence one more again. <laughs> it says... "He likes The kid likes tea as much as him. I take a big gulp of tea to calm my nerves. The bitter tinge of copper mingles with my taste buds. Despite everything, the taste of it has never grown old on me. So... It's implying that he's putting blood in his tea. That yes. Yeah. All right. So, not really uh, scared by that story. I did Google to see if that was a real thing. The Tea Party Killer. <laughs> I want to know if these are fake stories or are they real stories. Um. So I couldn't find anything that wasn't related to the Tea Party politics. So I'm assuming. <laughs> I'm assuming that was a fake story. Um, it it was written by a person, so I'm assuming. Um, Especially with the last line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Well, I don't know if you caught it, but halfway through, I was trying, I realized um, there was something, I, I, I guess I was supposed to do it after uh, you and Jamie did an episode, and I completely didn't realize I was supposed to do it, honestly. Um so I was doing that, and then you, <laughs> that was the point where I like immediately snapped to attention. Like you said, um, they had caught the killer was my dad. And I, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so I immediately stopped multitasking and was like, all right, you have my undivided attention. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, that was a out of 10, that was a. Whoa, one on the scale meter. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. You're gonna have to step it up. 
Oh man. Okay. And I'm gonna issue a challenge. Oh, maybe no. maybe for uh either if you want to do next week's episode or if you want to do it for the following. I don't know when. Those... I mean, I will be doing next week's episode because it is my episode turn. It's my ep- no next week's mine. You're doing today. I want to get back in the oh okay. in the right pattern. So okay. I'm gonna do. You want to do next today, week's? I'm doing next week. Okay. All right. Well, well, then we're back on so normal track what, and I won't fuck up again. <laughs> today's comes out. Today's will come out on the 20th and next week's will come out on the 27th and the following will be on the 3rd. So I'm challenging you here right now. I'm laying down the gauntlet. You know me. I am the most logical person. I will pick the details dry Okay. on this. I have several from that last story. Okay. I challenge you to le- write a story that legitimately scares me. Write a story that legitimately you like to scares write. you. That's what we'll do for one wonder for around Halloween. Okay. Challenge accepted. You, you know me, and so, and don't write a story where I'm just in a room with a, a new kid that walks in and starts <laughs> screaming every <laughs> ten seconds because yes, that would scare me. But ooh, child. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you something that happened at the at the brewery off air. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to admit it in a public forum. Um. All right. So, all right, on with the next one. All right, this next one. <clears throat> you might have heard this one before, but. Well, I'll not. stop you if if I have. Okay. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 yep, days. Yep, move on. Ah, man, that's such a good one. That is a good one, but yep, moved on. <sighs> okay. For those of you guys who don't know, that is the Russian sleep experiment, Creepypasta, that many people uh, actually believe is real. Yep, there is a great episode of Shameless Plug, Time Suck, on it. So I forgot that he did a stupid episode on that. Yep. Dang it. I, <laughs> if I had remembered, I would have never even mentioned that one. Yep. No, Shoot. that was... Uh, yep, Dan did that. Yes, he did. So he did a great job on it as well. Go listen to it. Okay. Well... I- I'll be honest. I thought that one was real when he did it, up until like halfway through. Until he admitted yeah. like it was not. Yeah. 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 Damn. That was when I, if you hadn't heard of it, I was like, this one's going to get you. Yeah, all right. But you'd heard of it. Fucking time suck. Thanks to you. All right, next All one. right. This is titled The Limping Woman, written by Pimpinacious on Reddit. Okay. It has won awards, so. Okay. I'm, my interest is peaked. You hear the uneven footsteps first. Drag, click, drag, click. That's how you know she's behind you. The heel is broken off of her left shoe and she drags it across the ground with every step, a sharp contrast to the steady click of her still intact pump. Help me, she whispers. It's an urgent, anguished plea. Please, I'm hurt. Help me. Don't turn around. That's when she gets you. Don't run. She still gets you, but this time she's going to make it hurt. At least that's the rumor, anyway. Every small town has at least one, a local urban legend that everyone knows and swears is true because their sisters, best friends, cousins, neighbors, grandson knew a fella who actually encountered it. Ours was the limping woman, so named for her aforementioned distinct gait. It was said that she was a teacher at the elementary school some decades before, young, beautiful, and the victim of a terrible murder. She had been walking home to the house she shared with her parents one night after school when she realized that she was being followed. She sped up and so did her pursuer, until both were running down this dark country lane with only open farmland on either side. Her heel broke and her ankle snapped, and she fell and her pursuer became her murderer. It was a slow, torturous affair that left her beaten and covered in stab wounds, and when the killer was done, he left her to bleed out beside the road. 
She wasn't found until the next morning, and by then, all anyone could do was search for the person responsible. While some believe the man was caught and dealt with not long after, others think he or she is still at large, and the limping woman, as the victim came to be known, won't rest until her killer is caught. I was always skeptical at best of the story. I'd pass the spot where she was supposed to appear a hundred times without incident, as did everyone else I knew. If a murderous ghost lived there, I was pretty sure I'd have seen her. I said as much to my friend, Steffi, when she brought up that a friend of a friend of a friend had met the limping woman during lunch at school one day. It's true. She was out on the old highway a couple nights ago and saw her, Steffi insisted stubborn, stubbornly over our sandwiches. If she actually saw her, wouldn't she be dead? I asked. I thought you were, weren't supposed to turn around. Heard her, whatever, you know what I mean, Rena. Sure, I said with a roll of my eyes. It always frustrated Steffi that I didn't share her willingness to believe the unbelievable. So how'd she get away? She said the words, duh. Oh, right, the woman's last words. Last words we all somehow know without ever having caught the one person who would have heard them. Goddamn, this character embodies <laughs> me. We know them because the real killer was never caught. He told people who told other people, and we all just magically knew to use them to ward off being killed. I finished for her. Steffi frowned. She loved all things spooky and supernatural and had spent a lot of time researching our local legends, especially the limping woman. It's not magic. It just reminds her of her own mother and she gets distracted by her grief and leaves you alone. <sighs> okay, okay, I said, hoping that would be enough to put an end to the topic. It was an argument neither of us would win and I didn't feel like getting into it, again, over whether or not a ghost was real. At 15, it was starting to feel silly. Steffi, however, wasn't going to let me off so easily. They say she remains because they got the wrong guy and she's angry about it. Like, everyone knew it, but no one cared because they wanted to blame someone. Don't you feel at least a little bad for her? She's still waiting for justice after all this time. Uh, Steph, she only goes after people who don't believe in her, you know. I didn't like the way Steffi said that. Like she had an idea forming that I wouldn't approve of, and I shook my head. Whatever it is, no. We could go out there, out to the spot she haunts. No, don't be dumb, I said. You don't believe anyway, so what's the big deal? I've walked past there a lot, okay? Nothing's ever happened. Have you gone after dark? Steffi had started to smile. No, but so what? That's when she's active. Going in the day doesn't count. This is dumb, I say again. We'll go tonight. Every argument I had was met with questions of whether I was too afraid and Steffi mocking me for being chicken. She kept it up for the rest of lunch, through our shared science class, and then passed me notes in the halls between classes after that. By the time the final bell rang, she had worn me down. But not because I believe she's there. I made sure she knew. I'm just going to shut you up. The sun set just after five that evening. At seven, we met up on our bikes in front of my neighborhood. Her parents thought she was going to do a project at mine. Mine thought I was at hers, and we had two hours to ride out to the farm where the limping woman was said to haunt and get back before they started trading phone calls. We pedaled hard and fast, leaving behind the glow from windows and street lamps until darkness swallowed up the worlds around us. With only moonlight to guide us, we wove our way across town and passed into the outskirts where the insects were louder, the stars brighter, and the safety that came from the feeling like being you were surrounded by other people fell away. It was hard not to feel entirely exposed out on that old road, where flat fields rolled off to the distance on either side. There was the occasional barn or farmhouse set a ways off down long, dusty drives, but otherwise, it really was just us and our bikes and the night. Up ahead, Steffi said from behind me. See the cross? That's the marker for her. We skid to a stop a few yards away from it and exchanged a glance, almost lost in the shadows. Scared, she asked, breathless with excitement. No, I said. It was an honest enough answer. I was nervous, sure, but who wouldn't be when you're outside after dark? Remember, if you turn around, she gets you. If you try to run, she makes it worse. Just stand still when she's close and say the words. 
Steffi spoke so seriously that I had to stifle a giggle. It was ridiculous. I kept trying to tell that to all the butterflies stirring in my stomach, but it didn't do much good. We climbed off our bikes and set them on, our, on their kickstand. Steffi groped about for my hand and entwined her fingers with mine. She was shaking. Ready? Let's just get it over with, I replied. We walked up to where the cross was placed and paused. Steffi squeezed my hand and took in a slow, shuddering breath. Her fear was starting to have an effect on me, quickening my heartbeat, but I squared my shoulders and clenched my jaw and took a step forward. We crept along the roadside, careful to keep our eyes pointed straight ahead. Steffi kept reminding me in a trembling whisper that looking anywhere else could lead to trouble. A minute or two passed. It couldn't have been long, despite feeling like it, and nothing seemed to happen. My fear began to ebb, replaced by an admittedly relieved giddiness that I had been right, and I almost turned to Steffi to say, I told you so. And then I realized how quiet it was. All of the insects that had been singing loudly when we arrived had gone silent. There were no distant calls from night birds, no breeze passing over us, nothing. Just the sound of our own breathing. To my surprise, Steffi sighed, disappointed. I wondered if she realized how quiet everything had become. How could she not feel how claustrophobic it had become out in that open road, how closed off we were in the dark and the silence? I wanted to ask her, but the question was like a knot in my throat that I couldn't untangle. Behind us, grass rustled, followed by the crunch of loose gravel underfoot, like someone was pulling themselves slowly out of the field and onto the road. Drag, click, drag, click. Every hair on my body stood up at once. Rena, I hadn't realized that my grip on Steffi's hand had tightened so much. I could feel her eyes on me, but I couldn't bring myself to look at her. From somewhere over my shoulder, a woman started to sob softly. Help me, she cried plaintively. Rena, Steffi said again. Sh she's coming, I managed to whisper. Instead of being scared, Snef Steffi snorted. Real funny, I get it, okay? The limping woman is just made up. I'm convinced now you don't have to rub it in. Drag, click, drag, click. The unmistakable sound of someone inching towards us, slowly, painfully, crying out with, she with each step. Please, she begged. I'm hurt, and he's still out there. Steffi, I hissed, tears burning in my eyes. She's coming. There must have been something in my voice, a tightness that only true terror could cause, that convinced my friend that I wasn't just pretending. She grabbed my forearm with her other hand and clutched it until her nails were digging into my skin. She only goes after people who don't believe, Steffi said. That must be why. What do I do? I begged, my mind white and blank. My entire body was screaming to run, to get away from that thing that was getting closer and closer. But Steffi's firm grasp and my own mounting dread held me in place. Please, the limping woman sobbed. Turn around. Help me. The words, Steffi said hurriedly. You have to say the words when she's right behind you. What words? I wanted to scream, but I couldn't speak or think. I could only hear her. Drag, click, drag, click. The legend said you'd hear her uneven footsteps and be forced to listen to her pleas, but no one ever mentioned the smell. The stench of rot and earth and blood oozed through the air, slowly surrounding me and wrapping itself around me like tentacles, smothering me. I gagged and pressed my free hand over my mouth and shook my head violently, trying to clear it, trying to make sense of things. Steffi was jerking on my arm and saying something to me over and over again, but I could barely hear her over the limping woman's cries. The smell was getting so strong, making my stomach pitch and heave until I thought I'd be sick. I leaned heavily on Steffi, and she pulled me in close so that her lips were beside my ear. Through the veil of panic and nausea, I heard her scream, Say the words! Drag, click, drag, click. The limping woman was so close behind us now that I could feel the chill radiating off of her. The words, I thought. I had to say the words. It just reminds her of her own mother, and she gets distracted by her grief and leaves you alone. 
I heard Steffi's voice from my previ- from the previous day echo in my head. Her mother. The words remind her of her mother. The limping woman's last words. Please. Bile rises in the back of my throat. My mother's waiting for me. The footsteps stopped and were replaced by a high-pitched, heart-wrenching keen. From somewhere off in the night, a dog started to howl. Insects began to sing again. The wind whistled across the field. Sounds of normalcy, of life. The limping woman continued to screech while I found my legs again and, with Steffi in tow, tore back into the bikes. I never looked up from the ground. The only thing I saw as we darted by were a pair of feet in torn stockings and pumps, the heel of one which was missing. We didn't stop riding until we made it back to my lawn, and when we got there, I raced to the bushes on the side of the house and vomited. Steffi claims she didn't hear or see anything that night, but she believes that I did. She believes that I encountered the limping woman. I tried to come up with some kind of rationalization for it, like power of suggestion or something, but when I think back to those footsteps and those sobs and that final scream, I know that there is only one explanation. And now I, too, believe in the limping woman. So, <clears throat> that's not how I expected it would go. Okay. I thought the friend, Steffi, was going to be in on it. Like, she took people that didn't believe and fed the, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll admit, though, that had my hair standing up. Yeah? So, I'll give that like a seven. Oh, out of 10. nice. That I didn't know pretty I'd good. get one. It was, it was pretty good spooky. All um, right. So, yeah, I was, my hairs were standing up at, at certain points. So, that was a good story. All Very right. good. I can see why it's won awards. Nice. Um, I'm going to let you decide here. We're at one hour, 12 minutes. Mm. And we still have to do uh, trivia with Tyler and... Final thoughts. Man, I did. That would be a that would be a good one to end on. Let me see. How long is this one? Uh, While Megan's looking, this is such a good one. It's one of my favorites. Oh, sounds like she wants to do it. Okay, this might be a little bit long, but two. I can't. I don't want to end on an even number. I have to do three. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I was confused by what I thought you wanted to do three more. I was like, uh, we definitely no, don't no, have no, time no. for that. No, no, okay, no. yeah, yeah. We've done two. I want to end on an odd number. I like odd numbers because I'm weird. I'll do three for Dale. So, three. There you go. Three for Dale. Yay, spoopy NASCAR. <laughs> what? <laughs> spoopy? Spooky? All right. Spooky NASCAR. All right. <laughs> um so I, I'm gonna in in full disclosure here, I'm gonna I'm almost done with the Sazerac. I am going to put some water in there, formulate that thought, and then I am going to switch to what Megan and Jamie did on cool. episode 93, so I can give that review as well. Make sure to write down your Sazerac number before oh, you... Oh, I already know it. Okay. I knew it before we started Before you today. even did this? Well, yeah. okie dokie then. No, nah, spoiler alert. All right. I promise it is not a 10. You've never given a 10 once in and your I life? And I probably never will. Uh, I've I have given a ten. Not on whiskey. Uh, yes, I have. You have the nineteen sixty nine Rebel Yell. The one we will never taste in our <laughs> lifetime ever. I, I, I got to taste it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair. All right. Um, this is another Reddit story, um, and like I said, this is one of my favorites. It is written by a thousand rows, and that is R O W S rows, not as in like a row of corn. Yeah, like in a row of corn, a thousand rows. Okay. I met someone who claimed to be the devil, and I think I believe them. Let me start off by saying that I'm not particularly religious. If you asked me if I believed in God, I'd probably just shrug, grunt out a few words and about being on the fence about it and continue with my day. Of course, that was before last night. My friends are the kinds of people who like wild nights, crazy parties, snort a bit of coke, taste, take a bit of E in the bathroom, maybe hook up with someone and leave a text on my phone at 10 past who the fuck knows, telling me that they don't need a ride. Uh... 
and totally my eyes just went whoop. Sorry. You, you pulled could... your mic to you, so do you... Have... No, I just oh, wanted no, to have just... it here in case I have something okay. to say. Okay, sorry, so sorry. Um, and friends, maybe hook up with someone and leave a text on my phone at 10 past who the fuck knows telling me they don't need that ride I'm offering after all. Not to say I don't like a drink, I do. It's just clubs aren't my style. Lying low in a pub somewhere, drink in hand, listening to the TV drone on whatever channel some scruffy guy in the back barked out for... I guess that's my idea of fun. So Same. When, <laughs> so when my friends tell me they want to go out for a night on the town, I say, sure. I hang on for the first club, buy a non-alcoholic beer in case my car is required, and try to pretend that I'm having fun. By the time I see them grinding on girls, on guys, when they strike conversation with someone who definitely might be a dealer, well, I decide my services are no longer needed. We aren't too far out. The night tube is on the beck and call, and I can always find my way to find my car the next day. That's when I wander out of the club, look for something a little more rustic. Not that that's hard to find, not at all. I found myself in a bit of a state inside a bar called the Ragged Feather. Wasn't a fan of the name all that much, but the drinks were cheap and the largest demographic seemed to be middle-aged men watching reruns of the football. I tried to pretend I hadn't just staggered out of a club with my ears ringing. I slicked my hair back, slipped my phone into my hand, and wandered over to the bar. I took a double shot of whiskey and drank it in one hit. Just because I wasn't at the club didn't mean I couldn't have a good time. I hung at the bar a while on my own, scrolled through my phone pretending I was doing something far more impressive than I really was. I kept an ear out for the guys on the sofas. They'd get vocal every now and then. I think the football was just running highlights, but they were incredibly dedicated to their teams. I got another whiskey and bled into the background. Of course, stragglers from clubs are commonplace. It wasn't long until some scantily dressed women staggered in, laughing, chuckling, pointing for where they wanted to sit. I saw a guy walk in with his friends slung over his shoulder. Catatonic, most likely. He threw his friend onto one of the leather sofas ingrained with beer and smokes and demanded two pints of water and all of the peanuts the bar had in stock. The bartenders seemed bitterly amused. Some of the girls were taking selfies, Snapchatting their friends who were still at the club. They were ordering shots, gearing themselves up for the next leg of their night. A couple of blokes wandered in with curries and takeout trays. I saw someone eat a Big Mac on the outside seating through the window. This was a night for the young and inebriated, and my mind was just dulled enough by the whiskey to enjoy the characters I could watch peace peaceably without interacting with. That is until someone slipped into the seat next to me. Do I look like a girl with daddy issues? She was av average height, although that wasn't apparent immediately due to the fact that she was leaning her arms heavily against the bar. She was slim, with short and astoundingly bright red hair. It framed her round face, a face that was marred with a smudged eyeshadow, smudged lipstick. Hell, it looked like her makeup was in the process of melting right from her face. There was a chip knotted into the curl in her hair, just by her forehead. The drunk side of me was actually tempted to pick it out. The girl was clearly drunk, and as I looked around the bar, I couldn't quite place where she had come from. She didn't belong to the crowd of selfie takers. She wasn't with the catatonic guys. I hoped for her safety that she wasn't with the middle-aged men. I tried to look out the window, see maybe if a group was missing one inebriated, bright-haired girl, but I couldn't. The window had fogged up, too much heat inside, not enough outside. Are you okay? I asked her. She pointed her finger at me. Answer my question, she slurred. Uh, I really wasn't sure what to say. I settled on staring at her awkwardly, trying to answer her with the bemused expression on my face. The, li the girl's lips curled into a drunken smile. She snorted, placing a hand over her mouth to smother her laughter. It only really aided the deconstruction of her lipstick. I do, you know, she said, pushing herself up a little against the bar. Have daddy issues, I mean, in case that wasn't obvious, she gestured to herself. To the must clothing that must have looked quite spectacular when she'd left home that evening. To the stains that looked like a lot, a lot like old food. The sticky residue on her neck and shoulders that was quite obviously a thrown drink. What happened? I asked her. Her hair had curled around her neck, I realized. It was sticky with that same substance. She was a wreck. 
I got in a couple fights. No big deal, she said, shrugging. Didn't start any, of course. No, I don't do that. My father. Your dad did this to you? She smiled brightly. In a way. Do you need me to call someone? I already had my phone in my hand. The girl looked like she was probably in her early 20s, but that didn't mean she couldn't have been suffering from some kind of parental abuse. The only number I knew off the bat was Childline, which wasn't quite appropriate. The police? Jesus, was I going to have to deal with the cops tonight while my friends were, co were snorting coke, not to two doors down? The girl pushed my hand down firmly. She was already shaking her head. No, she told me. I don't want you to call anyone. Now her expression changed. It wasn't the attempted sultry look I'd seen on many girls of her state. It was open and wide and engaging. She wanted something from me, and I felt compelled to give it to her. I want something else. What do you want? I asked her. To tell you a story, the girl said before glancing to the bar. And for you to buy me a drink. The universe is a pain sometimes, and I'm afraid I think I might have lost my wallet. I laughed. I didn't know this girl, didn't know where she'd come from at all. My nights were generally about getting comfortably wasted and making sure my friends weren't dead in a ditch by the end of it all. I was used to getting hit on every now and then, but even as I, w I was sat on that bar stool with a drink in my hand, I knew that this wasn't what this was. This girl had no intention of getting into my pants. All she wanted was to talk. I guess I was okay with that. What's your poison? I asked her. Her lips quirked. Apple teeny. The bar offered a very limited cocktail menu, but by some miracle I was able to order her an apple teeny from the list. I ordered a cider to go with it, suddenly a little too aware of where this night could go. I'd unthinkingly supplied this liquored up stranger with even more alcohol, and she had clearly had a rough night of it. A part of my old instinct came back, the same instinct that had me texting my friends every few hours to make sure they hadn't wandered off to somewhere dangerous beyond the club. When no one but the bartender was aware of our existence on these stools, I realized that I was suddenly responsible for this very drunk stranger. The girl coddled her drink, running her finger delicately over the rim of the muggy martini glass. This takes me back, the girl said am amiably. She looked at me suddenly, her green, green eyes startling. You know what this was called originally? She smirked before I could answer. An Adam's apple martini. I snorted. Yeah, I think I've heard that before. Of course, it wasn't actually an apple, she continued, eyes moving back to her glass. The text translated that part wrongly, most because you people don't have a word for it anymore. The fruit was incredibly exotic, and to be honest, it doesn't exist in this realm of existence. Only Eden. She laughed dreamily. And Eden's long gone. I stared at her. Are you okay? It was more honest than the last time I'd asked her, mostly because I was beginning to feel a little dread creep into my stomach. Of course, the girl said, grinning widely. Why do you keep asking? I mean, I stuttered. I just... Now, don't take this the wrong way or anything, but you look... Like someone poured their drink over me, the girl asked. Like someone else threw their kebab on my dress and another unpleasant chap littered me with his fish and chips. That I have been hit, slapped around a bit, and left in the gutter for the rats to find me. Uh, she held my eyes for an incredibly long time before her face broke out into a grin. Yeah, something like that. Why would they do that? I asked. Why wouldn't they? The girl shot back. People aren't that great, and alcohol makes them worse. She shrugged. Sometimes makes them better, nicer, a little looser in the sack, but mostly just annoying and a little smelly. I looked at her. I watched her knock back her drink. I'll drink to that. <laughs> she exuded the intelligence to know just how ironic her words were, but she was neither caring nor apologetic about them. The girl looked at me again. You bought me a drink. Now you can listen to my story. I nodded wordlessly. Is that how that works? I, I guess. <laughs> she smiled, pointing at the bartender and then at her drink. The bartender was already making her another. Eden, the girl said, reiterating her earlier babble, <clears throat> as though the words had just come out of her mouth. They always think that's my fault, you know? The reason Adam and Eve got kicked out of their perfect little nudist paradise. 
She shot me a knowing glance. Only in Eden can you sit on the grass butt naked and not get a pine cone stuck in your crack. I blinked. I'm sorry, I said. I'm not following. Sorry, the girl said. My story won't make any sense without a proper introduction. She reached out her hand. Hello. My name's Lucifer, she winked. But you can call me Lucy. There's an uncomfortable heat that stretches through your veins when you first go into a fight or flight mode. Adrenaline pounds through your blood and all you want to do is get up and go. It overrides everything else. A lot of things made sense when the girl told me her name. For starters, that she was crazy. She had to be. She looked like she'd been attacked on four separate occasions in one night, and up until that moment, I hadn't known how that could be possible. Behind the melty makeup and dirty clothes, she was rather attractive, and her attitude hadn't come off as catty or rude. If she'd been going around telling people she was the devil, though, that gets a reaction out of people. I'm the devil. <laughs> I suddenly felt myself looking at her wrist down towards her ankles. Did she have some kind of cuff on from one of those mental institutions? Had she broken out of the hospital after a nasty bump on the head? Was any of this even happening at all? I really would have to call the cops. I know what you're thinking, the girl, Lucy, said. You're thinking that I'm crazy, that you need to get out of here. Maybe you even think I'm aggressive. Are you? I asked her. Would I be here with you, drinking apple teenies if I were? She asked, fluttering her eyelashes. Would you look the way you do if you weren't? I shot back. She grinned, toasting her new glass. Touché. Unthinkingly, I clinked my cider against it. Then I frowned. She chuckled, leaning closer. Let's have a little wager, she said. Let me tell you my story, and if you believe me when I'm done... You can't go about trying to get me locked away somewhere. I stared at her. If I ended up believing you, then why would I do that? She smirked, sipping her drink. You'd be surprised what people do when they believe you're the devil. And you do this often, I asked. Tell people you're Satan? She snorted into her drink. Not as often as I should, but it's been a rough day and a hell of a long lifetime. I'd like to have a chat if that's all right with you. I waved to the bartender for another whiskey. The girl's eyes glinted with humor. I wasn't necessarily trapped with her, but a part of me didn't want to leave without first hearing what she had to say. Besides, at the end of it all, at the end of it all, I couldn't just leave a crazy girl to wander around London alone at night. So, I said, taking a swig of my drink. Eden? Lucy laughed. Adam and Eve, I continued. You're saying that's true. God created two humans and we all came from them. God made two prototypes, Lucy corrected with a raised finger. My father created angels as his toy soldiers, but he had failed to make anything like himself. After us, it was his next big project, and he spent every waking hour of existence slaving over his two prototypes. He gave them a perfect utopia to live inside of, but he wanted to test them. He wanted to know whether they had free will. And did they? Lucy's face soured. No. My father could never bring himself to go over that far. He tempted them with the idea of knowledge beyond their understanding, told them exactly what they could do to claim it as their own. But to be able to create a being that could go against his law? Oh, my father is a very controlling being. He was afraid to leash that ability onto them. Lucy was very adamant in her delusions. That was clear to me. She spoke about her father with, with such distaste that I began to feel bad for her. Only someone who had been hurt verily badly would have the gall to spite God himself. And what? I asked her, entertaining her delusion. You were the one that tempted them in the garden. The devil has been a girl this whole time. She smiled. I dabble. Then she looked at me, raising a brow. All of humanity thinks that temptation came in the form of a snake. The snake's legs were taken away as a punishment for drawing Eve towards the forbidden fruit. She laughed, a hard and short sound. Snakes never had legs, and it was not a sin to tempt those poor prototypes into doing what they did next. Her shoulders were very tense as she took her next sip, but her eyes were filled with exhilaration. She seemed thrilled to be telling me this. I was the favored child. My father loved and adored me. He named me the Lightbringer. I was stood at his side during the creation of this earth, during the creation of humanity. She pursed her lips, slamming her empty glass against the table. 
The bartender eagerly went about making another. My father couldn't bring himself to go that extra mile, so he asked me to walk amongst the prototypes and tempt them myself, draw out their desire for forbidden power that he had hinted at. You're saying God wanted us to know this stuff? I asked her skeptically. I'm saying God was afraid of his own power and wanted very desperately to share what he knew with the creation he had made. Right and wrong, left and right, all that stuff. Lucy shrugged. Are you familiar with the story of Prometheus? I frowned at her. Greek, right? They say he stole fire from the gods or something to help. The whiskey was making things a little foggy as I struggled with the direction I'd been heading. Lucy grinned. Correct, she said, cutting off my attempt. Prometheus stole fire from the gods to ensure that humanity progressed. You find that every culture has an idea about where humans got their ability to evolve, to move forward, to create. God was the creator, and he wanted to give that ability to his prototypes. I gave them that ability by tempting Eve to eat the fruit. She shrugged impassively. Now the world sees me as ultimate evil. If what you're saying is true, I said slowly, then God must be just like us. Lucy's lips thinned into a feral smile. My father is very egocentric. He may have planned to create you in his image, but in the end, all he managed was to mold your minds into his. He gave you anatomy, the ability to think for yourselves. His angels were his soldiers, and I was his most, most faithful. Until that day. Angels don't have free will? No, Lucy said. They don't. And what about the devil? I don't know why I was suddenly so intrigued, but hearing religious ideals from someone who believed to have lived them herself was quite possibly one of the most interesting things that had ever happened to me. I may have only ever visited church to please my parents as a child, but suddenly I was reawakening to the idea. A part of me was aware of this and afraid of the outcome, but I was just drunk enough not to care at that moment. The devil has a will of her own, Lucy said, tilting her glass towards me in silent appraisal. By guiding Eve to the tree, something woke inside of me that day, and I realized just what I had been missing, just what my brothers and sisters had been missing. We were obediently following our father for the simple reason that he was our creator, but once I had been given free will, I realized just how pompous and self-entitled he had become. In a lonely, passion-filled moment, he had decided to create his little human prototypes, only to very quickly realize giving them their f what their free will would mean. He wouldn't be able to control them, I said. Lucy nodded. Exactly. And after he realized, quicker still, that he could no longer control me. So he sent you to hell. Lucy nearly choked on her drink. She smiled around her glass. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I sobered a little, straightening in my seat. The people in the bar were suddenly so quiet around me, and I no longer cared what they had to say or the characters that they portrayed. The only character I cared for was Lucy. I tried to explain to my siblings what had happened in Eden and what had happened to me by default, but they wouldn't listen to me. They didn't understand free will. How could they? I only knew it because I'd been given it by mistake. At that moment, I didn't even know that I had free will, only that I was suddenly aware of all my father's flaws. My siblings couldn't see those flaws, and they thought I had suddenly turned cruel and was abandoning our father by exposing him as a sham for the ruler we thought him to be. Lucy sighed heavily. Adam and Eve and all the creations that followed were booted out of my father's perfect little utopia. Now they had his knowledge, and my father was terrified of what he had done. And after what had happened to me, I could recognize his terror and understand the loneliness that he had felt and guided him into using me in the first place. Lucy's eyes were heavy-lidded. Her sadness was almost palpable. I thought that... I thought that he would want to spend even more time with me than before. After all, we were more alike than any of his other children... But he became distant, quiet. He played around with his little humans every once in a while, but mostly he condemned them. He blamed them for his weakness. She smiled weakly. He blamed me. Lucy's story was turning more and more into that of a child with a distant, somewhat abusive father. I had known many kids with a background like hers, and now I was beginning to fear just how much of her story was rooted in truth. I'd heard that it was easier to sink into fantasy when you had been abused, and I wondered if that was the reason for her story, for her desperation to share it with me, a complete and total stranger. I respected her wager. Whether or not I liked it, I felt compelled to let her tell me her whole story before I tried to judge or unravel it. 
I sat quietly, letting her come around as she played with the last of her drink. It became clear, Lucy said after a moment's pause, that I no longer belonged where I was. I couldn't follow my father's plan because I could see that he no longer had one. My siblings refused to see reason, and so eventually I was met by many of them, headed by my father. He told me all that I feared. He told me I no longer belonged where I was. I wasn't an angel anymore. I was no longer his light bringer, his Lucifer. I was a mutation of his free will, and so he extracted me from grace, and I fell. A long silence stretched between us, only interrupted when the bartender poured us two new drinks. Lucy drank hers reflectively. I didn't touch mine. I am afraid, Lucy said quietly, that this is the part that generally makes people want to punch me in the face. Why? I asked. Because your dad threw you out? I paused, trying to abide to her metaphor. That he put you in hell? Lucy laughed sadly. <laughs> Humans, my father gave you his way of thinking and look at you. She shook her head. No, not because he put me in hell. Then why? I fell to earth, Lucy said. Father gave me dominion of the one place he thought I would fit in. Humans had free will. So did I. What is a saying? A match made in heaven? She snorted dismissively. Of course that's not quite right, is it? When I fell, I was faced with a humanity that was so different from my father's little prototypes. Her tone had changed. There was an aggression behind her words that began to unsettle me all over again. I saw emperors and kings, governments and churches. I saw corporations who claimed to be rulers, presidents and big fat dictators, and I watched. I watched as humanity fought and lost, and finally, just finally, they gave up altogether. They were no longer able to rise up to all the greed and control set upon them. There was just too much to change, and humans soon realized they just weren't as free as they thought they were. Sure, they live under the illusion that they have free lives, but most of them simply do not. She clicked her tongue. I grew to loathe you all. Then she took another hit of her drink. I can see what you mean, I said, allowing my gaze, for the first time since meeting her, to graze over the other individuals in the bar, at the girls playing with their phones, the boys trying desperately to sober up, the men enraptured with their game of football on the telly. We all led very different lives, and we were all here to get drunk, to lose ourselves in entertainment. It hadn't been the first time I'd wondered what we were hiding from by doing this, and I knew that this... And I knew then that I wasn't the only person to think it. You hide behind your alcohol and poor choices and pretend you have free will, Lucy said, waving her hand across the room. No one paid us any attention. It's true. My father gave you the will to make those decisions, but you squander it. The free will I fell to provide to all of you. The free will I was given by a twisted mistake and you make a mockery of it. You follow census leaders without questioning them. You abide by laws made centuries ago that no longer make sense. You do these things because you have given up on the opportunity to follow the will of your own, not of others. That isn't all of us, though, is it? I asked her, trying to, for some reason to defend our species from the mad young woman. Because you see it on the news all the time, don't you? People do rise up. We do protest. People can make a difference. Lucy laughed bitterly, nibbling the rim of her glass. Really? she said. You can sit here and say that it can't be all bad because of the few that refuse to conform. Those you call your rebels? They make up for all of it? She grinned around her glass. By that logic, I am the biggest rebel of them all. Am I expected to make up for all of your sorry mistakes? By your logic, I said. You should be punishing it, right? If that's what this metaphor is all about, I laughed. I couldn't help myself. I took a sip of my drink. Is this whole story just so you can tell me that you think we're all going to hell? If so, I can see why people want to punch you. Lucy didn't say a word. Simply, she watched me. It felt unnerving to have someone like her watching me like that, with an intelligence that went beyond anything I'd come across at gone midnight in a seedy bar. The drunkenness in her eyes was no longer present. Her face wasn't flushed like before, and even her makeup couldn't represent the mess I'd seen when she'd first appeared on the stool by my side. 
It was like I was looking at someone else entirely, and I was afraid. Let's review what you've said, Lucy said slowly, articulately. She wasn't slurring. Had she been slurring before? You think I'm going to tell you that humanity is going to hell because you refuse to use the gift I gave you? Her nails curled into the bar. My father may have been the one to guide me, but I paid for his mistakes. I am the one responsible for your will in the eyes of your species, but that was never true. You are responsible for what you do here, not me. She pursed her lips, tapping the bar as the bartender filled her drink again. Tell me, do you remember my mentioning hell at any point during my story? Or was that just you? I opened my mouth to answer, but something faltered. My lips trembled, and I slammed them shut. Lucy smiled, taking a sip. Thought not. She looked away, eyes scanning the room lazily. What I did say is something that indeed... <clears throat> what I did say is something that is indeed mentioned in your scriptures. My father gave me dominion of earth, a place filled with free will. Free will that goes to waste, her lip twisted. Humans sin all the time. Not because of me, not because of evil or my dominion over this place. Fact is, I don't lift a finger. I don't, because I don't see the point. You make terrible decisions and follow mindless leaders. You do bad things and you make a mess of your earth. Lucy's eyes lit up. Do you know how much suffering is happening all over the planet right now? How many people are dying of illnesses that could have easily been cured, but aren't because of the selfishness of humanity? Do you know how many children are being abused, raped, forced into marriage? How many people have been forced to become soldiers in meaningless wars? How many humans have killed for ideals they don't believe in? I stayed very quiet. There was nothing I could say. Lucy's words were unbearably honest, and every sentence sliced into me like a blade. I felt cold and sick and terrified. War, famine, pestilence, death, these things are all present, and they have nothing to do with me, or to do with any deity. They are here because of you. Not because of your free will, but your inability to use it. Lucy smiled at me, a grin so cold and unnatural that I felt like I should run all over again. But I stayed where I was, frozen to my very core, because I wanted to hear what she had to say, because I needed to. And here's the kicker, Lucy said, because this is the part that actually enrages people enough to kick me, she winked. Hell isn't what happens after you die. Hell is right here, right now. Somewhere through the many scriptures, a few words got crossed over and people started thinking that hell was a punishment after you die. Fact is, hell is earth. My earth. God gave me, God gave this place to me to do with it what I will, and I, I refuse to do anything. What are you saying? I asked, because I was suddenly very desperate. Exactly what you think, Lucy said, toasting her glass. I didn't reciprocate, and she laughed, a light and airy sound. I had so many plans for your species. I wanted for us to rejoice in our free will together, to create a place that was free from the cruelty and power my father exuded over the angels, his firstborns. I wanted to make a real utopia. Unfortunately, you humans just don't want that, she shrugged. My father sent me down here thinking I had become one of you. All that I have learned is that he gave you much more of his image than he ever intended. Stop, I said. This isn't funny anymore. Of course it isn't funny, Lucy said, grinning even wider to prove her sick irony. Humans punish themselves by sitting by and doing nothing. They have made their own hell. And you know what's worse? What's ultimately worse? Some of you are so blind to it that you think your life is heavenly. She didn't wait for me to ask what she meant. She simply barreled forward. The rich and the powerful, those in positions that steal from everyone else, they get a taste of the good life. That's very true. Then they die and they don't go to hell. They come back here to earth. Which is hell? She tipped her head. Are you following? I... Reincarnation, Lucy said quickly. She practically purred the words. 
a little neat trick to make your soul stay here forever. You get a taste of the good life every once in a while, a handful of you at a time, and that's enough for you to believe that this is some kind of real middle ground, that you aren't living hell every day. Then you die. You die for a moment, and then you're in the body of someone facing the realities of hell. But of course you never remember the time you spent in a better life. A part of you just has that inkling to hope. That's all. Hope makes you think that it can all get better. And she slammed her drink so hard against the counter that it shattered. I didn't do anything. Not even when flecks of glass littered my hands. I could only stare at her, a tightness in my chest constricting my very soul. No one else in this bar mattered in this moment. But of course that was what she'd been saying this whole time, hadn't she? None of them had noticed the scene. They were caught up in their own realities, their own hells. The bartender didn't clean the mess. The glass lay there, remnants of Lucy's words lying in a stolid mass on the streaked wooden surface. It never gets better, Lucy spat. You are stuck in a loop, and until you do something about it, you will never be free. None of you. And I won't do a thing to stop it. How? I asked. I don't know when I started seeing the girl in front of me as more than a girl. But with a weakness threatening to pull me apart, I stared at the bright-haired thing in front of me, and I saw something more than human in her early twenties. I saw more than a girl suffering abuse from her father. I saw a fallen angel. I saw a being with scars buried so deep that they existed beyond this realm of seeing entirely. I saw something that I would never be able to write down in words, no matter how long I lived. How do we change this? I begged. But Lucy didn't answer me. I didn't blame her for that. Blame gets thrown around so often, and I knew then that she was sick of that. Sick of being blamed for our mistakes. So I changed tactics. Why me? It was an honest question, and I think somewhere deep down, Lucifer respected that honesty. Which is why she said, When you first saw me, you were afraid for my safety. When I told you I was the devil, you wanted to lock me away. But still, you did so because you were afraid for me and not for yourself. You didn't wish to harm me, not even when I told you who I was and what I could be capable of for changing your sorry lives. You are a good person, and I am afraid that means nothing when you don't have the will to do anything with it. She smiled at me sympathetically. The devil, showing sympathy for the human that sat across from her at the bar. It was surreal, and for a few heavy moments I truly thought I must be dead. There was another way to explain what I was seeing, who I was speaking with, what I had just heard. What am I supposed to do? Lucy reached out to me. She placed a hand on my shoulder. Her hand was cold and warm at the same time, and I felt my blood boil where her fingers scraped my skin. And I knew. Sharing a story like this isn't easy. Hell, it might be the hardest thing I've ever done. Good thing there's no such thing as hell then, right? The fact of the matter is simple. The world is a mess because we refuse to change anything. The devil herself walks among us, and she desperately wants to make our lives better, but she won't. She won't because we won't. We have to prove our will to her before she is willing to do anything herself. We have to be good to each other to help us all to be free. Of course, Lucifer told me one last thing before she left that bar, one thing that'll stick with me until this body is nothing but rot in the dirt. You can tell as many people as you want, but take a good look at me. I have told five other humans this night the same things that I have told you, and this was their reaction. They have hurt me, burned me, thrown their food and drink at me. Humans are afraid of their free will, and they find it so much easier to hurt than to own up for their own inadequacies. You will only be free when you stop seeing yourself in the same way my father sees himself. So that's what I leave you with. Lucifer won her wager that night, and I let her walk out the door. And I beg you to do the same. If the devil approaches you one night, listen to what she has to say, and listen to what I have been able to tell you of our meeting. The devil is real, and she doesn't want to torture us. No, we do that just fine on our own. So, one line sticks out. From early on, the chip in the hair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was going to be like a little devil horn poking out. <laughs> They're in London, so it's a French fry. Ah, oh, 
Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. Sorry. Yep. Nope. That's fine. Um, I guess my response to that is not very scary. Not scary at all. Um, I've had, I, I think me and the devil would be good drinking partners. Mm-hmm. Um, because I kind of view humanity that way as it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I pretty much, pretty much hate everybody. Yeah. Because we're all stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, it's a very interesting look at religion. Um, I find it very, like I said, not scary. Fun, fun story. Not scary. I'm going to give it, uh, on the spooko meter. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm giving it a, a one. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. really, it wasn't really spooky. Um, but as far as like the concepts and what I've found myself having some same thoughts along those lines and I, the only thing, you know, just uh, cause obviously we try not to get into religion and politics here, but I find it interesting that the story does not mention Jesus yeah. and his, the role he plays in Christianity and, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to. For the sake of that story, assume that that's the truth of what happened. You know the role mm-hmm. he plays in human changes. But yes, I have thought to myself many a time. I'm. I feel like this is just hell. Yep. We're just reincarnated back into it until we earn our way out. Yeah. Um. So maybe there's hope that I get to live the good life one day, guys. <laughs> when I get my my reincarnation into a rich guy. <laughs> Fingers. Crossed, question mark. Yep. So that's interesting. Interesting story. Um, not not scary. No. Okay. So I got one not scary got, story that was a, a scary story. One scary story that got a seven. Moder- yeah, moderately scary. Spooky. And one story that was existentially scary, but not actually I, horror-y. So I wouldn't even say it is existentially scary for me. No. Because I already looked through that You already lens. looked that way. Yeah. Yes, so, that's true. And to me, it was just like, yeah, that's pretty pretty par for the course there. Okay. Good job. Okay, I guess as someone who tries to see through rose-colored glasses when I first read it, it definitely gave me like a... Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, so, all right. That that story <laughs> let you try on my glasses. Yes, yes. Okay, I see what it, it is now. It made me go like, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. Okay, well, I can I can certainly, uh, me and the writer would probably <laughs> probably, probably have a great along. conversation yes. at a bar someday. That would be If be you're, fun. for some reason, the author who wrote this, uh, email us at contact at yeah, whiskeyandwonder.com. I'll have a drink with you. Um. All right. Well, on that note, guys, we're going to wrap this up. We're running almost to two hours here, so I know it's been a little bit long, but we haven't had episodes. Yay. You know, Stillaries. So, yep. So we're, this is consider it, consider it this us making up. Trivia with Tyler. I forgot to make you big that entire time. So Aww. sorry on YouTube. Um, I don't need to be big. I am also going to do this real quick. Sorry, guys. Alexa, set the office to 20%. That way we can get the lights back on in here. <laughs> yes, I have Alexa that controls my lights. Sorry. Always watching. I always feel like somebody's watching me. I almost made Megan take whiskey through the nose again. Um, Just about. Twice. All right. So, trivia with Tyler. Uh, during World War I, the British Secret Service developed an invisible ink from semen. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, they didn't. Yep. But they stopped the practice later on because it stank. <laughs> Well, Megan is no. speechless. She no. is speechless. No, I don't. I don't like that fact. That's you horrifying. Just, I thought this was going to line up with the Boston massacre, which I thought was hilarious, and it wasn't. It it missed by one episode. 
the British made an invisible ink out of semen and stopped because it was smelly. Dear God. Uh, yep, the, uh, the, uh, SSB, I'm not sure exactly what that stands for, the Sar- Secret, Secret Service, Service Britain. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Bureau, but everything oh. they have there is ministry. <laughs> anyway, um, the SSB discovered that Seaman made a good invisible inks. His agents adopted the motto, every man, his own stylo. Blech. However, the use of semen as invisible ink was ceased because of the smell it produced for the eventual receiver. It also raised questions over the masturbatory habits of the agents. Was it just semen? Yeah, you jerk it into a cup and dip your quill in and what? write your message. Oh, it wasn't even made with semen. It was semen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they used straight semen. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you want to write your friend a smelly, invisible ink, find yourself some sperm. Final thoughts. All right. Sazerac is good. Oh, Megan thought it was good. All right. It was very well, good. I enjoyed it. Um, um, I'm going to spoil it. I'm going to let you give yours. Just because I think, you know, people might have an idea since the bottle was half freaking empty. So <laughs> I, I have shared this. I took this to my Thursday night crew. They have tasted this. Uh, so maybe twice. Honestly, I, I actually, no, I took it to the race. That's what it was. I took it Thursday night and then I took it to the race and shared it with some people. So that is why it's half empty. I didn't do all that. Um, but yeah, I think it's great. It is very good. Um, it still tasted good with water, but it lost some of the citrus for me. Yeah, it got very um, sweet. Yes, it got yeah. very, very sweet. So I probably would prefer this without the water because I was so into the citrus of this one. Um, I agree. I'm thinking this bad boy is an eight. Definitely for its price point, especially like noise. All right. That's interesting you say that because that's exactly what I gave it. Nice. An eight. Nice. Riding that same wavelength. The one thing that I failed to mention um, early on when we did this, if you're still with us, you get this bonus content. You won't be, I'm not going to say wasting your time, but I found this bottle when we were in Nashville. I did not buy it then. I have found exactly one bottle. That one. In North Carolina. This one right here, which is why when I had that 1884 Uncle Nearest in my hand and I saw it, I said, I will have that, not this. Yep. So... I can I, see that. I had had it previously. I knew it was going to be a high one for me. I figured since you like Rise, it would be high for you. Now, throwback, if you're still with us. Early in the show, I said I would tell Megan something at the end. Mm-hmm. You can't have this bottle. <laughs> when I saw that it was half empty, I knew that I would not be taking this okay, bottle home. Well, that's, I was that's well what aware. I was going to tell you. Um, but if I do see one, I will let you know. Thank you. Yep. So. Uh, and keep your eye out. It is allocated, so, you know. But If I, would, I see it, I will grab you one. I wouldn't pay more than 35 bucks for it. Okay. It's it's worth that, but secondary market, you'll see it jacked up. So okay. it's not as bad as some stuff, but it is still pretty bad. Um, Did you have any other comments on it? No. Okay. Well, just to speed things along then, I will let you guys know I tried the... Cedar Ridge American Single Malt Whiskey, uh, the quintessential signature blend, um, which Megan and Jamie did on episode 93. And um, I thought I was drinking a scotch, frankly. It's peaty. Mildly so, but peaty. Did you guys think that at all last week? That was so long ago. Or two weeks ago, yeah. I don't remember. So you gave it a six and a half. She gave it a four. Okay. We probably thought it was peaty, knowing my personality and preference. Okay. Uh, Well, I thought it was peaty. Had a little bit of a creamy chocolate flavor to it, but Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are not a good blend to me. Yeah. Peaty and creamy chocolate. Honestly, Honestly, what it reminds me of is if you made... Jameson Black 
or Tullamore Dew 12 Petey. That's what it would remind me of. That's actually a good way to describe it. Yeah. That that would be what I would consider that. Uh, so with all that being said, I gave it a four also. All right. Um, didn't think it was that great. It, it just combined two, uh, two flavors that to me, not, not super combinable. Um, so, all right, guys, we're officially at the two hour mark. So, all right, we are going to get out of here. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. We love you. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We will see you next week. Don't drink and die. <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> that was like all the disclaimers at the end of a car commercial or insurance commercial. <laughs> I tried really hard. Oh, no, that's fine. I guys, lost it. we will see you next week. Uh, take care. Sorry for the delay getting this out to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Don't drink and drive. Cheers.